DeLorean Motor Company is one of the most interesting car companies to have ever existed. The car itself might not be the greatest car, far away from it actually, but it's the story that makes this car so great, with all the events that happened during and after the production, but most importantly because of the guy behind the brand. John DeLorean is one of the most interesting persons that the car industry has ever had. Not only because of all of his creations before DMC and his playboy lifestyle, but most importantly because he went and built his dream car. And also because he went and tried literally everything to save his creation. So hello guys and welcome back to another video and here is the story of John DeLorean. John DeLorean was born in Detroit on January 6, 1925. Being born in Motor City, John wanted to be part of the car industry and to build his own car since a young age. But he would have quite a rough childhood. His father, Zachary DeLorean, worked at Ford Plant, but every so often he would get drunk and trash his wife and their four sons. This made John to work and study harder. He would enter Lawrence Technological University for Industrial Design. But in a short time he was drafted for military service in 1943. He would serve three years in the army, where he would excel and show that he was a hard worker. After returning from the army, his parents were divorced, so he decided to help his mother and his uh, three younger brothers. Later, he would return to college, where he would finally get his degree. And in 1952, at the age of 27, John started working as an engineer at Chrysler. But he really disliked the Chrysler environment, and so he decided to leave for Packard. After the war, it looked like Packard was one of the most prospect car makers in America by producing some of the best cars of the time. The same great engineering that produced Packard's famous torsion level ride. Here's proof that Packard's full length torsion bar suspension is even further advanced for 1956. Now, motoring becomes pleasanter, safer, more relaxing in every way. And here's a sample of Packard's power. The new Packard V8 engine delivers more driving force to the rear wheels than any other engine. It's America's easiest handling, safest riding car. It doesn't take an expert to notice the distinction this car carries with it. For 1956, Packard's Ultramatic transmission is operated electronically at the touch of your finger. Electronic push button control. Another triumph of Packard Engineering. Safest, surest, smoothest of all automatic But seeing that the small names had no chance against the big three, John decided to leave Packard in 1957. He saw GM as the best option, where he became an assistant engineer at Pontiac. And in a short time, he became Pontiac's head of technology department. Back in those days, Pontiac had quite a bad image, with most of the buyers being the elderly. John's goal was to change this by making Pontiac a more exciting brand. In a short time, the market share of Pontiac grew from 4% to 6.5%. This basically gave John a free reign. And so, in 1963, John started working on the car that not only would change the face of Pontiac, but also the American market forever. 
The GTO is often considered to be the first muscle car, even though there had been plenty of ordinary cars fitted with big engines before that, the GTO defined this segment, which also made the others take notice. The car proved to be hugely successful. Pontiac sold over 31,000 cars only in the first year of production. These were extremely good numbers considering that the original GTO was just a trim lever for Solomon. With this enormous success, DeLorean became the head of the whole Pontiac division, where he would introduce new practices, practices that no one was using in America back then. And in a short time, Pontiac became one of the most innovative brands in America, and GM executives took notice. And so they appointed John head of the Chevrolet division, which wasn't on their best state at the time. DeLorean managed to transform Chevrolet the same way he did Pontiac, and so he continued climbing the GM ladder. And in 1972, he would become vice president of General Motors and when looked like he was one step away from being the head of General Motors, John decided to retire in 1973. This came out of nowhere for everyone, but the whole time John had worked behind the scenes on creating his dream car, and probably this was the best time to fulfill his dream. By 1975, John had drowned a number of drafts, and had started working with Giorgetto Giugiaro. By this time, Giugiaro had founded his own design studio, Ital Design, who was working both with European and American names. John always had been a huge fan of Italian supercars and Italian designers, really appreciating the fine lines of their cars. But while Giorgetto was designing a masterpiece, John was working on finding the necessary funds to create a new company from the ground up. The turnaround of Pontiac and Chevrolet had gave DeLorean a great reputation, and also a ton of contacts with the top investors in America. Despite this, again was a bit hard to find the money. There had been no successful independent car maker in America after the Second World War, and with all the labor unions and bureaucracies, creating a new brand was no easy task even for John DeLorean. The biggest problem was finding a place where to build a car. US, of course, was out of the equation. Originally, John was considering Puerto Rico, but he dropped the idea when he read about the unemployment in Northern Ireland, which due to the civil war was facing a ton of economic problems. Despite this, DeLorean, being a tough negotiator, continued to play on both sides hiding from Puerto Rico the fact that he already had signed with the British. The impression at the time that you were negotiating it that you were involved in a race? Uh, I was involved with competition, yes, but uh, not a race. Were you playing one off against the other? Mm, I think that's making it sound a lot cruder than it was. The British government was trying to create as many jobs as possible in Northern Ireland, so the idea that one of the best car engineers of the time was trying to build a new and advanced factory sounded perfect to them. With this, the British government gave DeLorean a grant of 70 million pounds, making this way the majority of the 200 million dollar capital. Since John had spent most of his life on various motor plants, he undertook the planning of the plant himself. And since he was coming from General Motors, he tried to avoid all the mistakes that they were making back then. General Motors, like the rest of the American car makers, was probably at their lowest points at this time, and all had to do with managing the production line. But this was something hard to achieve in Belfast, since no one had ever worked on a car factory before, and a good number of them had never had a job before. The construction of the DMC factory began in October 1978, and would last two years. Meanwhile, the work on the car was still going on, and like for the design, DeLorean decided to go with another mastermind, 
and he was Colin Chapman. Chapman and Lotus, like a number of other sport car makers of the time, worked under commission by developing and sometimes even building cars for other brands. Chapman is one of the greatest car engineers of all time, and every single car that he was ever involved is a masterpiece. But the DeLorean is known for its handling, power or performance, or anything related to Chapman. The partnership between Chapman and DeLorean would become a nightmare from the beginning. The original plan was to use a rotary engine for the car, but DeLorean failed to secure a patent for the Wankel powertrain, and Chapman wasn't a big fan of it anyway. But there were bigger problems than this with DMC accusing Chapman and Lotus for using the money for their cars and a racing division. So I used to visit Lotus periodically, and the engineers would tell me that we've got 100 people on the payroll, they're working on Lotus cars, when you and John come officially, uh, they move back the Lotus cars and they put out a DeLorean and pretending they're working on it, they're doing these engineering things which are more for themselves than for us. And actually, when I went back to John, I said, John, this is what's happening. He said, it always happens in Detroit. When you hire consultants, they rip you off. And, I, and he said, everybody knows that. And I said, but John, why do they have to rip us off? The DeLorean investigation later showed that Colin was paid $18 million. The investigation also showed that the payment was done via a Swiss-based Panamanian company run by a DeLorean distributor. The interesting thing about the Lotus involvement is that part of the DMC project was sold to Toyota, who later introduced the MR2. So who knows how the real DMC would have been if Lotus would have finished the project. The original plan was to start the production in 1979, but due to a number of delays the fin and financial difficulties, the production only started in January 1981. The production car had changed a lot from the original concept. The design was mostly the same with some small changes. The design was very 70s Giugiaro. Giugiaro was one of the first to jump on the wedge shape style design. In the 70s he designed the Lotus Esprit, the Bizarre Mimanta, the BMW M1, but most importantly the Alfa Romeo Iguana, which beside the wedge shape design also shared the stainless steel body which the DeLorean is so famous for. But the biggest change was underneath the car. Like I mentioned before, the 1975 prototype had a rotary mid-mounted engine. John was quite a fan of the rotary engines, since he had been one of the main guys behind the Chevrolet Wankel project, even though he was the guy that cancelled the mid-engine Corvette program, saying that it was too impractical and too costly for a Corvette. But differently from the 60s and early 70s, by the 80s the Wankel engines had died off, with Mazda being the only one who was continuing to develop this engine. There were a number of engines that were considered to replace the Wankel one, but in the end they chose a PRV V6. This was an engine developed jointly by Peugeot, Renault and Volvo. The engine was based on the 2.7 liter version, but DeLorean used a 2.85 liter version which was built just for them. Despite this, the engine only produced 130 horsepower, which was nothing for a car that had a curb weight of 1300 kilos. The interesting thing about the PRV engine is that Alpine and Venturi also used versions of it. Of course, these cars weren't Ferrari and Lamborghini level supercars, but they were pretty capable. Not only the engine, but most of the parts were outsourced from other manufacturers. The interior also had many parts from other manufacturers, most being from regular cars, so the quality wasn't the best. Also, the chassis had changed, changing this way the layout from a mid engine to a rear engine. While most of the time decisions like this lowered the price of the car, this didn't happen with DeLorean. The original price of the car was supposed to be $10,000, but when the car entered production, just the base price was $25,000. When John was asked why he the car was so expensive, he answered, 
it's a DeLorean friend, people appreciate fine things. So the car was hanging only on the design. The gullwing doors combined it with the unpainted stainless steel made the car to look very exotic and futuristic. John was sure that the car would be very successful in America, where a number of European sport cars weren't even available. The initial idea was to sell to 8000 cars a year. This was quite a high number for such a car, even though Chevy was selling over 30,000 C4s per year, which also had a similar price. But the DMC was no match for the C4. Initially, thanks to the pre-orders, looked like the DeLorean would be a big hit. But the hype died in a short time. In 1981, DMC built 7500 DeLoreans, but only 3000 cars were sold. While most would slow the production, John made the weird decision to increase it by 100%. At the same time, DeLorean was working on a number of other projects, including here a DeLorean sedan, a weird 4x4 vehicle, and also the DMC-80, which was a city bus. But with the sales going down and down, the recession in America, all these side projects, and also with the expensive lifestyle of DeLorean, all that few money that DMC had started to run out pretty quickly. John had some pretty wild plans if DMC succeeded including here the acquisition of Jeep and Alfa Romeo and a number of other small brands, and later maybe the merge with one of the big three, possibly Ford. But as we know, this never happened. By 1982, DMC was in big financial trouble and looked like the company was going to go down pretty soon. But John wouldn't give up that easy. He tried basically everything to save his dream. First he went to the British government asking for another grant, but not pleased with how the first grant was spent, the answer was a straight no. Mr. Pryor, can I ask you, are you going to offer Mr. DeLorean any more money? No. None at all? Well, I think that uh, I, I must um, not answer that question in any other way than the way that I've answered it. What do you think the future of the car firm is? No, I'm, I'm not saying anything at the moment. I'm. We've worked too long and too hard to let few little aberrations bother us and it's important that we re-establish our public credibility and re-establish our relationship with the government on a positive basis. And what happens to the DeLorean if you don't get any money from the government now? Well, I think you'll be very pleased with the news that you'll hear tonight. I can't tell you any more about it right now. Will you be speaking sure, After that he tried to find investors in America, but with the economical problems of the time the answer was again negative. After that he traveled to Middle East. Again, he failed to achieve a deal. His final solution was to ask for a loan, something that he didn't like. But seeing the financial situation of the DeLorean Motor Company, the banks also closed the door to him. But like I said, DeLorean wouldn't give up on his dream that easy. Before founding DMC, John had met a man by the name of James Hoffman, who was his neighbor. Hoffman was a career criminal, but he would become quite close with DeLorean. Hoffman, aware of John's financial troubles, would call him and suggest a scheme to sell 100 kilos of cocaine, but this was all a trap. Originally, Hoffman had tipped off FBI, saying that John had approached him and asked for a favor. Hoffman was facing criminal charges at the time for drug trafficking so he saw this as a way to reduce his sentence. Since John DeLorean was, in, was going to be involved on a big drug deal for the time, FBI took this operation pretty seriously, and on October 19, 1982, DeLorean was arrested and charged with conspiracy to obtain and distribute 25 kilos of cocaine. Between this and the other, it'll generate... Uh... The whole deal was a setup by FBI who wanted to record everything, 
since that was the only way to put a man like John DeLorean behind bars. Meanwhile, without money and with the owner facing drug trafficking charges, DMC closed the doors forever, at least for car production. In 1982, DMC had built 2000 cars, which of course was far away from John's plan, but pretty good considering that for a good part of 1982, the factory did not work. The factory was sized by the British government, which started the liquidation process immediately. The British government also started an investigation process for DeLorean and DMC. Since this process was mostly about DMC, would reveal way more interesting materials than the American trial. The DeLorean trial of course took the attention of all the media, but despite this, on August 16, 1984, John DeLorean was found not guilty. The reason for this was that John had never been part of any illegal drug deals, since the whole operation was a setup by Hoffman and FBI. Despite being filmed with a suitcase of cocaine, DeLorean was found not guilty. In a case that made legal history, the jury decided he'd been entrapped by government agents. Life uh, as a hard-working industrialist has been tattered and torn. I, I don't know, would you buy a used car from me? If <laughs> <laughs> I could get every American to send us two dollars, we'd be alright. Yeah, maybe a dollar and a half. A dollar and a half, that's what we need. By this time, DeLorean Motor Company was total history. John DeLorean would face a number of other ac accusations later, including here the British trial, where a judge said that if DeLorean would have been in UK, he would have been sentenced at least 10 years. With the reputation ruined, John would mostly live a quiet life after this, even though he would try a number of other business ventures but he would leave the car industry forever. DeLorean would declare bankruptcy in 1999, while he would pass away in 2005 at the age of 80.